friends, and welcome to another episode of Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your faith, or as my trusty friend and co-host Linda likes to say, it's the show that helps you grow. You know what? It is the show that helps you grow, and it's going to be extra growth today because wow. we have a really special guest with us. Steve Carter is here with us today. Um, he is the author of a new book called uh, the Thing Beneath the Thing. He spoke here at Saddleback a couple of weeks ago. And um, Steve, I'm just really grateful that you're here. First and foremost, I understand that you were tweeting about the Cubs today. That's because we, <laughs> on, the, on the day that we're recording, baseball is coming back, Hallelujah. which is which is great. Now, this episode is coming out in a couple weeks, but when we're recording, baseball is coming back. So Steve, how long have you been a Cubs fan? Yeah, great question. Um, I've always <laughs> liked the kind of teams that nobody ever expected to win, you know, and 108 so, years was a long time. It's a long time. And I was there uh, <laughs> for game five of the world series. Oh, and so, nice. um, I, I love, love Wrigley, um, love just, uh, the Cubs. Um, I love the Clippers too. And I'm so a they, okay. They I'm win. a Clippers fan. This is amazing. <laughs> Okay. This is a, are you a Cubs fan too? I, I'm, not, I'm not a Cubs fan. I'm an Angels okay, fan, but okay. I'm a Clippers fan. But I, but we also have more in common, Steve, because I am a Cal State a Fullerton Titan. Uh, so Come I just on. felt some kinship with you on the weekend as you were talking about being on the bench at the basketball game. I was like, <laughs> Fullerton. I, I almost cheered out loud, and I would have embarrassed awesome. myself no, in, in church. Awesome. But. <laughs> that's fantastic i love it i love it well it's such an honor to be with you uh, i love what you guys are doing I'm, how five years that this podcast has been going five years this may this podcast will, will have been going i think this will be episode 262 or something like that when it goes out so it's a <laughs> that's an that's a that is that is a that is a sprint of a sprint of a marathon that is beautiful thanks for doing this work so, super thrilled to have you here. Uh, Steve, I wanted to start by just talking about this season that you've been in. I think you could say it's been a roller coaster season for what you've been going through uh, recently and whatnot. So I just, I'm just curious, what have you learned about God in this season of your life? Yeah, so I would say four years ago I was in Chicagoland and, um, kind of like the unexpected happened, which, um, it happens in all of us, like in our stories. And, um, it, it kind of led me to really have to wrestle with how, how do you respond to change? Mm -hmm. The change that you didn't see coming, the change that just showed up in your front door and you just were like, what, what, what? Yes. <laughs> and, um, for me personally, how I've always dealt with difficulty or stress has been through work or through, you know, channeling that into sports or uh, into some kind of progress. And I, I woke up in the middle of the night, um, it's about three and a half years ago. And I felt like the Lord say to me, go to the desert and wait for instructions. Mm. And I got up and I just, it, 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 these moments haven't happened very often in my life, so when they do, I know that there's a weightiness to it. So I got up and I grabbed my journal and I just started to write. And I, I wrote these words, you can't achieve your way out of this. You can only grieve your way through it. Oh. And I realized I didn't know how to grieve. And so I, next morning, my wife gets up and we're making, I'm making her coffee and I tell her, I had this experience with the Lord last night. She's like, what is it? And I said, I, I felt like God said, go to the desert, wait for instructions. We're living in Chicagoland at this yeah. time. <laughs> and I didn't think it was literal. I just thought it was like meta spiritual metaphor kind sure. of thing. Um, and my wife teared up and she just said, I've been sensing the same thing. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. And she's from Arizona. And I was like, uh, oh, this is literal. <laughs> so, we, uh, so we have been in the desert for the last, you know, three and a half years. And it's it's been a season um, that when grief or when um, pain that you didn't cause um, ends up showing up and you feel forgotten or forsaken to still experience God in the midst of, um, it has been a stripping away in many ways and, and a, a way in which God has surprised me of his kindness, of his goodness, um, of his protection. Mm. And so it's, it's kind of been this, I, I feel like I'm 
I'm the same, but there is a, there's a, there's like a weightier, um, a depth. Um, one of my friends talks about how we we're, we're so good with simple truths. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the simple goes through the struggle and, and when it goes through that struggle, it's like a refinement. And, and if it makes it and holds up all of a sudden, it's not no longer some simple truth, but it's a sacred weighty mm. truth. Mm. And I just feel like there are these phrases for me that have become profoundly weighty due to this desert season. Yeah. So, so in all this time, this desert season that you've been going through, you talked a little bit about some things that you learned about God. What's something that you've learned about yourself that you did not know about yourself beforehand? Um, well, I think what's amazing about the desert is, is, is you don't have distraction, Mm -hmm. um, that can sometimes, um, be something that you turn to without knowing it. You're yeah. just almost like I'd get up early in the morning. And I'd go hike in the desert. So I, I read all these books about the desert mothers and fathers. Um, and I, and I was like trying to, to understand why so many people go to the desert, why rehab clinics are often in the desert, yeah. Palm right. Springs or yeah. Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. what is it about the desert there? That is this kind of awakening space. Well, it's free of distraction. And What's interesting is then you're left with your own self, your own thoughts, your own brokenness, your Mm -hmm. own pain, your own. And now it's like, what am I going to do with this? Do I believe that God's going to meet me here? And I, I realized that for me, so much of my life was built around achievement, Mm -hmm. around proving, um, afraid, uh, like, grounded in scarcity. I didn't want to lose something, mm-hmm. um, protection of my, my image. Um, and, and really like just trying to like not let, um, everyone see me because sure. I was afraid that if they saw me, um, they wouldn't love me, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just this, mm-hmm. so I, I, in the, in the desert, what kind of came up was this, this vision of a life anchored in Jesus as one that has nothing to prove, nothing to lose and nothing to hide. And that just became this mantra. But I think it's because there was so much I needed to prove or so much I was afraid to lose or so much I needed to hide. And now I realized in Christ, um, I, I don't, I don't have anything to prove. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have anything to lose. And why, why be afraid to, to hide the broken parts of me? Cause that's where he's going to do his best work. It's crazy how it takes the desert yeah. uh, to do that. Right. It takes that openness. Yeah. It takes that barrenness. It, it takes that, you know, I, I can't hide anywhere here. And there's the, it's, and there's just that feel that literal feel of being stripped away and stripped down. Like you said, and you're just saying, okay, well, it's just me and God here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, let's see what's going on. <laughs> Yeah. You think about that for 40 years, the Hebrew nation walked in the desert and they wandered and they're like in circles because it's one thing to leave Egypt, but it's another thing to have Egypt leave you. Right. And, and that all of their identity that they had been generationally taught, it was in what they produced as slaves. Sure. And now God was trying to teach them, Hey, I, I'm not Pharaoh. I'm not Mm -hmm. like them. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to take a day to rest. (laughs) I know you don't know how to rest. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna teach you the way of Chick Fil A. Like you are going <laughs> to rest. You know. So so there's just these moments where I think for us some of this is from our childhood trauma, um, from our the things where we got success that was outside of um, maybe what God wanted for us. It's one thing to leave some of that, but it's another thing for that to actually leave us to allow more of God's unconditional love and grace to take over. That's amazing. Um, it just, even as you're talking, I'm just thinking, I feel like offline, I would just love to talk to you more. I feel like <laughs> I've got so much to learn from you um, because even what you said Well, let's about, dive into that here, Linda. Oh, let's I turn this that. into a counseling. No. <laughs> <laughs> let's not do that. But I just, I can't let what you said get away from me. And that is you can't achieve your way out. You're going to have to grieve your way out. And man, is that hard. So I just, I just wanted to affirm like, I've been in a, my own tough season and I just want to look you in the eye and tell you that is hard and it's scarier, but I just, I recognize how hard that <laughs> is, but I'm grateful because as we get through it, then God uses it. So that was amazing. Um, 
But you were talking about sort of these places where we hide and these, you know, trying to get through to our authentic, not hiding from Jesus selves. And it brings me to really my first question um, from the book, um, read the whole thing, loved it. Um, but you talked about the masks that we wear. And I love, as I'm reading it, I'm like, ooh, yeah, I wear that one. Like, has he been watching? Like, how did he? And then I read the next one. I was like, oh my gosh, I wear that one too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, I just, I was thinking about the fact that I probably wear several of these and I don't even realize it. And I was like, I'm sure I'm not the only one. I mean, they're just such ingrained ways of acting and being in the world that we just assume that's normal. And what I was thinking is how can we begin to recognize when we're hiding behind a mask? Because sometimes we don't, we've done it for so long, so effectively that we don't even realize we're doing it. So how can we learn to recognize and how can we learn to engage more authentically, like realize we're doing it and then do something different? How do we do that? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if, a little context when you think about the word hypocrite, for many of you, yeah. you listening, you know this, like it's, it, it, it takes you back to the days of amphitheaters and theater and a, and a hypocrite was um, an actor. And back then they would have maybe two actors on stage, 15, 20,000 people in Ephesus watching. And, and they, these actors, hypocrites would have these bags and inside these bags would be these masks and they would be multiple characters and they would just put a mask on and pretend. But if you put an A in front, like a Greek letter for A in front of hypocrite, then all of a sudden it basically means anti hypocrite. Mm, okay. And that's where we get the word sincere. And so the idea of being someone who is sincere is someone who has dropped the mask and is able to be seen for who they actually are, to be seen for what they've actually done, to be seen for what their desires truly are. But I think at a young age, we learn um, uh, for some of us around our own table, mm -hmm. we don't talk about this stuff. Or, hey, right. you, you, you put on a good face or you mm -hmm. act in this way or you, you, are, you are shown love by how you perform. And that's a mask. And I, I remember I, I coached the soccer team, I, my son's soccer team. We were called the Orange Monkey Fireballs. And <laughs> that is awesome. awesome. <laughs> um, but I remember I, I, I created note cards for each of the parents and I gave um, a number on the note card. And I said, hey, I want you to affirm something about this child, even though you don't know this child, it's just a different, it's not your kid. I want you to affirm something about their character. And you know what they affirmed? All, the only thing in the week one was they only affirmed a performance. Mm -hmm. You're really good at that goal. You're really great at that. And I said, character. I had to call a timeout and like bring the, all the parents and like take them to the shed and just say, hey, hey. I said, character. I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not trying to affirm their performance. They're going to be fine. I want, I want you to be able to see, did they hustle? Were they kind? Right. Or like, like how did you see that? So try it again next week. And by the end of the year, they got it, but we're so good at seeing and celebrating the mask of performance or being perfect right. or pleasing or pretending, or sometimes even in our struggle for many of us, we either power up or power down right. and we just, it's a mask. And, and I think the best way for me is, I know when I am super hurried, mm. it can be easier for me to put on a mask. Absolutely. I know when I'm super stressed and I feel like, or um, I feel like I'm going to fail, mm -hmm. it's easier for me to put on a mask. And I, what I've had to really learn is to begin to get in touch with almost that first question in Genesis 3, where are you? Mm -hmm. where, where are you, Steve? Like, where, where, where are you right now? And I, like right now, like I'm, I feel this and it's okay to say that. And mm -hmm. I have this desire and it's okay to say that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I think if I don't name that, my tendency will be to, and, and for many of us, many of you listening right now, the tendency will be to kind of move into a codependent behavior, mm -hmm. which is a mask. And I start to care about oh man, how you feel. And I feel responsible for how you think. And I feel responsible for your actions. And I, I start, I think it's Chip Dodge who teaches us. I, I feel responsible for like how, um, literally like, um, like 
I, I feel responsible for what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. Even though I don't know what you're thinking, right? And so all of a sudden we just start putting on these masks and the healthier thing for us to be is to be integrated, grounded, rooted in Christ and be aware of where we are in the story and in the moment. Yeah, and really what I hear you, you saying is we got to slow down to ask those, hard down. Qu- those questions. Because we get sometimes at such a pace that we don't have time. You know, we're afraid if we stopped and asked questions, we'd get behind. So, but to sit down and actually ask those questions, where am I? And to think through it and not be afraid of the answer. There's not a wrong yeah. answer. God's not yeah. mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, when you say I'm angry or I'm hurt or I'm afraid, it's like, I think sometimes we project our own frustration with ourselves onto God as though he's going to be, you know, <laughs> like if we say, <laughs> I'm really angry, God, that he's going to be like, ah. Oh, I didn't see that coming. You don't get to be angry with me, but he's not like that at all. And yet sometimes (laughs) I think that we assume that that's what he's going to do. So we don't even want to say out loud, you know, I'm hurt or I'm angry or I'm fearful. So one of the phrases you used in the book that I loved was courageous curiosity. When you talked about getting at the thing beneath the thing, when you talked about beginning to look under the masks, um, talk a little bit about there are times when we do feel fearful or hesitation to dig beneath because we don't know what we're going to find and we don't even want to know if we want to know what's under there and what we're going to do when we find it. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how would you encourage people to sort of move forward with this courageous curiosity and the value that that will bring to them? Yeah, well, I think one of the the, the helpful pieces for me is to ground it in grace. And grace is one of my favorite words on the planet. It just is such a beautiful truth. And, you know, you look at Paul as he details a bit of his story in first Timothy. Mm-hmm. Um, he really articulates how grace found him. You know, it's kind of acts nine. We, when I was at Saddleback, I had the privilege to teach on Ananias and, and how grace found him. Yeah, and yeah. so grace, grace will find you. But I think often for, for us, we stop there mm-hmm. and we're just grateful that grace found us. Yeah. And so we, we worship and we know that we're going to heaven and we're like, Oh man, but that's, that's not the end of what grace wants to do in us and with us and through us and for us. Um, you know, I, I often think about tiger woods and I love sports. And I remember, I remember, um, when everything came out about his past and what he was doing in the present with kind of the, the drugs and the the women, the affairs. And I remember, I remember people saying, Oh man, the guy got caught. He got caught. And I just remember going, that's grace. Cause grace will find you, but grace will find you out. Mm. And I, I think if we have the courageous curiosity to let grace find us out, because what grace wants is to make us whole, mm. holy and spiritually healthy. And so for me, the courageous curiosity is going, is there an area in my life that I desperately need grace to make whole? Is there a place in my life that grace is needed so that I can be healthy or live a life that really is holy or set apart? And I think for many of us, that takes work. It takes effort. And Dallas Willard says, uh, grace is opposed to earning but never opposed to effort. And Mm. it's the effort to allow grace to get into that childhood trauma, to get into that story of neglect or abandonment or to the counterfeit gods, as Tim Keller would say, Mm -hmm. the places that I've run to besides God. And it, and it actually sustained me, whether it was work, whether it was some kind of um, broken pattern, but I, I used that to take care of that little child within me. And now all of a sudden, as you start to be aware of that, you're like, Oh, be kind to yourself. Now, you know, Mm -hmm. and now you you were running from something, but now you can actually allow grace to be what grace wants to be. Does this allow you to like reattach to the father, reattach to the spirit, reattach to the son and his love and his grace and his peace. So that's kind of that idea, but it takes us getting curious of like, you know, why did I say that? Or why did I react in that way? You know? And as my counselor says, like, if you, if, if you get hysterical over something, mm-hmm. it's most likely historical. Yeah, that's <laughs> you gold. React, that is gold. You're usually reenacting the past. Mm-hmm. And so I think for us, it's beginning just to go, 
why did I say that? Why did I run to that? Why did I want to buy that? Why did I want to go look at that? Why? And there's a reason. We just have to be willing to, to get that courageous curiosity and let grace do what grace wants to do. I love that John 15 idea that, that, that they're going with. is no, saying is, okay, I, I see the vine. I see where the goodness is. And if I'm starting to be honest with myself and see all these, you know, asking myself these why questions, these why am I doing this? It's really acknowledgement that, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not attached right now. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a part of that vine right now. And so I'm seeing different things happening in my life than I, I would. And so asking yourself those questions and it points you back to this vine and saying, I just got to get reattached. I just got to get reconnected. And knowing that from that vine is Jesus from that vine is, 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 is that grace that you were talking about? I just love that idea. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I think it's so strong though, because yeah. I think for many of us and for much of my life, you know, Jesus says like, I'm the vine, you're a branch. I think for many of us, we want that for our life, but we're literally saying, no, I'm the vine yeah. and Jesus, you're, you're <laughs> a branch. And if you're going to make my life better, and you're going to make it more financially prosperous or like I'm going to be more healthy or we just go through a whole list of things, then you can stay connected to this vine. And, you know, Jesus is really clear about that. Like apart from me, like not <laughs> attached to me, you're, you're not going to do anything of lasting significance. Yeah. And I think that's what we want. We want to finish the race well. And I've just come to realize like, man, if I'm going to bear the most fruit, the healthiest long lasting, most sustainable, healthy through the spirit. It's not going to be my own strength. It's going to be, as you said, you know, connected and attached to the vine. Well, and, and that's where we get lost ourselves as we, as we start to think about God first and foremost as, okay, I'm in trouble. I need to get, you know, I, I, I need my needs met. And if you just think of God as provider in that to bring you back to status quo, if you will. And if that's all you think of God, then you are missing out on the John 10, 10 ness of this <laughs> full abundant life that God has for you. It's, it's not just bringing you back to a place of stasis is God has more for you. And if yes. you're connected to that vine, you'll start reaping that benefit of the more and more and more rather than, as you said, just thinking of Jesus as the branch. Okay, thanks. I'm so glad I've got that branch. I feel a little bit better. I'm going to go back to my way now until I need that branch again. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating because, and I was, I was just reading about this um, recently in, in the Bible and in Genesis 15, um, Abram and God are having a conversation and um, we know Abram becomes Abraham. And, um, but, but we know that there's been this like promise to Abraham, like you're going to be this father of many nations and you're going to, you're going to have this opportunity. Like you're, you're going to be blessed. And Abram, I love it. Ask the most <laughs> honest human question. He just literally asks, how can I know? Yeah. Like, how can I know? Yeah. How can I know? And then God's such a God of props. He's like, all right, bring me all these animals. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, he brings, so, so Abram bring, gets all these animals. And then God's like, all right, cut them in half. So we'll cut them in half. Right. And we'll literally like uh, put one side and one side. And this is all covenant language. In the right. Old Testament, older times. You did, This is how you did it. And basically this, the thought was, if the person doesn't keep his end or her end of the bargain, what happened to these animals will happen to them. Mm -hmm. So like, so Abram's thinking to himself, oh, God's putting this all on me. And so all of these animals are cut in half. And if I don't keep my end of the bargain, oh, it's on me. And Abram's distraught. He falls asleep. Then he wakes up. He has this moment where she's still feeling kind of heavy. And then what we see is the presence of God actually goes. And it's, it's profoundly theological because what, what is happening right from the jump, Genesis 15, this is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the Bible is God saying, this is on me. Yeah. This is on me. But what happens though, is we put so much on us. I got to do this. I got to do this. Yeah. Well, when you actually understand, no, 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 this is all on the promiser. 
Like this is the one who made the promise. He's saying, Hey, it's on me to, if you stay attached to me, you're going to bear much fruit. It's on him doing the work in us. But so often I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know that <laughs> I'm going to, I got to go do all this stuff. Like I got to, and this is like the same thing for many of the listeners. Like it's how do you believe God sees you? Do you do, he doesn't, he doesn't see me. And he's like, man, Steve, that was a great talk. Just a great teach, <laughs> man. Like the, the Colossians says that when he looks at me, he sees his son Christ. And what has happened in me is I don't have to prove my existence. I don't have to prove my love. All I have to do is just keep the remain thing, the main thing. Right. I have to, I have to work to remain and abide and make my home in Christ. I have to trust the promise and walk in that promise and believing that the God of all creation beginning and end isn't done with me. He's not done with us. He's not done with you. And if I trust him at that and he's going to bear much fruit. And that's, that's like a, I think we know that it's in the applying to the every day that gets a little wonky for many of us. For sure. I was, even as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, I know these things, I can recite them, I teach them, but then when it goes, comes to living them out, then I forget them practically. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Why can we know this? I mean, like, and be able to recite it and, and, you know, chapter and verse it, but when it comes to the actually living it out, sometimes we revert back as though, like Pastor Rick calls them practical, it's practical atheism. It's like we're acting like <laughs> we don't know who we are, we don't know who God is, we don't know what's true. Like, what's happening there? Yeah. Well, I, you think about Paul. I mean, he, he writes this in Romans. Like, right. I do not understand why I do, like what I do. That's the thing, the good I want to do, I don't do. And the thing I hate, I do. Like, I think, I think many of us, we wrestle with that question. Like, again, why did I say that? Or why did I, why did I go silent in that moment? Or why did I power up or power down? Like, why, why? And I think, again, that just brings us back to, for me, just a fierce level of compassion going, mm -hmm. I, I don't know this yet. I thought I know it, knew it, but it's just in my head. It hasn't, yeah. it hasn't made its way down the 18 inches to my heart. It hasn't <laughs> moved down to my, like my belly. Like it's become like this fire in my bones that Jeremiah will talk about. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just this process of me really not just acting like I know it or pretending, but really beginning to embody this truth or this idea and really create like that spiritual muscle memory. Mm. And that takes it just takes time. And so for me, it's like, I just look at it and go, ah, I haven't learned that yet. And I gotta, I gotta, I gotta just be a little kinder myself and get a coach or a mentor or a counselor or a yeah. friend to help me walk this truth out so that it can seep into the marrow of my bones. Yeah. I think sometimes God gives us more grace than we give ourselves with that stuff. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> You know, we beat ourselves up. It's like, what was wrong with you? And God's like, I'm right here and I love you. And it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what, what Dallas Wheeler has a great line. He says that saints, you know, Christ followers should burn through grace faster than sinners ever could. Because mm. we're just so like reminded, oh, I need this. We're so, you know, it's, it's, it's wild because even our understanding of confession Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're really good at confessing that we were wrong pre-Christ mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. and then, you know, like I need, I need a savior. And then it's like, I should be right now. And yeah. I, I think it's like, that's the power of like CR celebrate recovery. Like, sure. I just think it's, a, you know, when, when I've been to those meetings, like you sit there and someone's like right from the jump, just saying, nah, this is, this is who I am. And this is what I've struggled with. And, and this is also who God says I am and who I'm trying and allowing God and his goodness and grace to, to make me. And it's, it's just this honesty with who we actually are. And I think we, we spend so much time just trying to not let people see the real us and God sees it. And most people see it. <laughs> We just spend a lot of time trying to hope and pray that people don't actually see our insecurity or our fear or our worry. And I just rather save the time and just say, nah, this is me. <laughs> I'm in process. I need more grace. Steve, um, when we're talking about emotional health, 
it seems like I think people have an easier time as they're thinking about spiritual health or financial health or their physical health. It's like, okay, I can see the tangible thing. Like, I can do this. I can start this habit. I can do this practice. But when we're talking about emotional health, people just go, dig up my stuff. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so Let's not do that. What are some some habits or some practices that you've started adopting that you've seen have really helped in, in, in going deeper in this area of emotional health. Yeah, I, I, I would say a couple, a couple come to mind. Um, I have um, two practices that I do on the regular. One of them, I'll, the first one I'll talk about is from Proverbs and it says above all else, guard your heart, you know, for everything flows from it. And then you get to like verses 24 through 27, I believe. And it, it starts to unpack like what you say, what you see and where you go all comes from your heart. Right. So I, I, I spend, and I reflect back on my last week, usually on a Sunday night or Monday morning, the last week. And I just, I want to get really honest with how well did I do at guarding my heart? And so, um, I just kind of, I, I look back and I go, is there anywhere that I didn't guard my heart? Well, Wow. And I just, I just kind of write about that. And so we're like, oh man, that, that part, like I let that negativity creep in or mm-hmm. I let that anxiety maybe have too much time or that bitterness, man. And then the second thing I do is I play it out. So I go from like reflection to almost um, starting to have a moment of just what I would say, like re almost like re kind of doing like a, a redo. And I, I play it out and I imagine myself in that same situation again. But I imagine like Christ beside me and just saying, okay, you're tired or you're anxious or you're hungry. Wow. Um, what's a more Jesus minded, what's a more like kingdom minded way to, to act. And I just kind of write about that. If I had to do over, this is what I would do. This third one is, you know, I replay kind of like redo. The next one is I talk about playing it smart. So I play it back, play it out, play it smart. Mm. And the playing it smart is, Hey, above all else, guard your heart. So I have to refuel my heart. So if everything flows from that, how well am I taking care of my heart? Um, I love nature. I love God's word. I love friends. I love great experiences. I love time with my family. Like look at my schedule. Am I, am I, am I making time for that? Or is it a lot of stuff that's just draining because if everything comes from that and it's a, it is a weak heart or it is a uninspired heart, man, that's, that's going to, I'm, it's going to lead me to paths that I don't want to go. So play it back, play it out, play it smart. And then lastly, I just commit to play it honest mm-hmm. so that when I, I'm trying to get um, quicker and better at identifying the emotion that I'm feeling in real time. Oh, and, and so that when someone said like, Linda, how are you? And it's the easy answer is, oh, I'm good. Yeah. But like to be able to say, ah, today's a little bit harder. I love it. Even as we were talking about the grieving part, you yeah. just stopped <laughs> and went back there. That's playing it honest. And, and I think we have to do a better job of celebrating. Thanks for being honest and human. Mm-hmm. Thanks for being honest and human. That's, that's a gift that you allowed me the chance to see you and you saw a part of me. Mm-hmm. So that's one practice. The second one is a, is a prayer practice that mm-hmm. I do pretty much every day. Um, and I can do it through my phone. I can do it through writing, but I just ask myself a slew of questions. So I think about the garden and I question, we already talked about, where are you? Mm-hmm. I just kind of, today I'm tired, today I'm stressed. I just kind of write mm-hmm. a paragraph. And then if we think back to um, the kind of Hebrew scriptures, you see that the Hebrew nation was in slavery. And so I just go, hey, in the last 24 hours, where did I feel oppressed? And which I obviously my experience is different than what um, the Hebrew people felt. But I, when I think about oppressed, I, I, I can think about it feeling as tempted. I can think about it as some sense of... Um, maybe it was on Twitter. Some people just said some mean things or, you know, but it's, it's, it's often something in that, that regard that I just kind of write about. And what's amazing is God rescues those people and and he takes them to Mount Sinai and at Mount Sinai, he offers them the, the 10 commandments and his commitment to be with them. And that's why I say in the last 24 hours, where did God meet me? And what's amazing for that is I can say through God's word, I could talk about, you know, doing this podcast with you two and having conversations like where did God just like, just show himself in, in a real and tangible way. And then it moves to Jerusalem. So it's Mm -hmm. like from 
garden to Egypt to Sinai to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a little bit like Spider-Man theology with great power comes great <laughs> responsibility. And so I asked myself, hey, in the last 24 hours, where was I responsible or irresponsible with the unique gifts and talents and power wow. that God's given to me? And I write about that. And we know that the Hebrew nation wasn't uh, like really responsible with that. And so it led them into Babylon where they cried out Bob Marley as they remembered Zion. <laughs> and, and they, and, and so I think about that is I, I move it from the last 24 hours to the next 24 hours, mm-hmm. the next 24 hours, what's my next best right step. And usually in the middle, if I, if I'm writing it out on a piece of paper, I draw a little cross and I, I, I put a circle at the bottom of the cross and I goes, Hey, is there anything I just need to lay down mm-hmm. to carry this cross well today? And sometimes it's, bitterness. Sometimes it's frustration. Sometimes I have to forgive and there's a name of a person or Mm -hmm. there's something that I just, I'm just choosing to let down and lay down. So that's kind of the the little process that I do on the regular and it helps me just be attached a little bit more, um, uh, more aware of what's actually happening within me. Yeah, that sounds like such a powerful thing that people can start engaging with. And my encouragement for people who are listening that think that sounds awesome. I want to do this. Understand that it probably, that it takes time to get used to doing this type of thing, especially anything that you are talking about your own personal honesty and opening yourself up and being vulnerable. Even if it's just between you and God, the more you engage with it, then the more honest and open you're going to be, the easier it's going to come. Cause the first few times you might start journaling or something like that. And you're like, ah, I don't want to write about that, or I'm not, I don't, I'm not feeling like putting that to ink, you know, kind of thing. But over time, as you continue that practice, it becomes easier, and you'll be more excited to get, you know, to release more in that. It, was that how you experienced it, Steve? That over time, you just snowballed more and more. Yeah, no, I think it's really, really good. And I, you know, I have like, I have phrases I have to say to myself often, like, Steve, be kind to yourself. Mm. Like, mm. There's no map for this. Yeah. There's no, 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 this is the first time that anybody's ever tried to live this life in this body. Like it's not, and, and I, with the experiences that I've had. And so you didn't know. So be kind, be yeah. kind to yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, you know, and, and celebrate recovery, like it teaches you, you know, it might not be your fault, but it, it's your responsibility now. Yeah. And, and now it's like our responsibility, but I think just to go slow, you know, to take what you both have said, um, maybe the maybe the phrase is a show that's going to help you grow by reminding you to go slow. You know, but it's, like, it's, 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 yes. it's just these moments. Just All right, to we'll like change the tagline. This is good. <laughs> this is good <laughs> to, to to experience, and and then it's like muscle. Um, you, you're you're starting to build that emotional trust with Yahweh, with God, with Christ, right. with the Spirit, and it might feel foreign at first. And like, I don't know what to do with my hands, but like you literally like have a moment over time where you're like, man, like God, you were so faithful. Mm -hmm. Are you met me in that pain? Or you saw me in that moment of celebration? Like you were there. And so that's, I totally resonate with what you're saying, Jason. That's Mm, spot on. That's good. If you, so, so obviously we want to push out Steve's book, The Thing Beneath the Thing. It'll be in the show notes. So make sure to check that out. Both Lynn and I have read it. Both loved so it. Good. So really encourage you to check that out. Steve, one thing that we always love to ask guests that we have on the show is what are maybe a couple of books or, or podcasts? Also, Steve has some podcasts too. So we'll put those in the show notes there too. So make sure to look at that. You, um, you have the Crafting Character podcast um, that is, that is ongoing right now. So uh, make sure to check that one out. And then, um, uh, Steve, I'm, I, I'm drawing a blank on, on the name oh, of the, the other home one. Team. Yes. The, 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 home that's team right. Podcast. The home team yes. podcast. Th- that's right. Um, so make sure to check that one out too. Again, in the show notes, but Steve, what are some other books or podcasts that you have been reading or listening to that lately that you would recommend to our listeners? Yep. That's great. I mean, I love, I love reading and um, I feel like you are what you eat and you are what you read. (laughs) Um, And I, I've, I found myself going back to a lot of classics Mm -hmm. um, in this season. Um, And so I really love uh, divine conspiracy. Um, 
Uh, it's by Dallas Willard. Mm-hmm. There's a whole, a whole slew of reno- renovation of the heart. It's yep. another great one by Dallas. Um, Parker Palmer has a great book called let your life speak, which I really, okay. um, love. Um, I've been doing a lot of research right now on the parables and there's a great Jewish, um, writer who kind of breaks down the, what the, the parables meant in context yeah. against Brad Young. Um, and so I don't know, I, those are the, the ones that come cool. um, off the top of my, my head, but yeah, I, I, I love that um, from podcasts. Um, and I'm, I'm literally like all over the map. Um, sometimes it's sports, <laughs> sometimes yeah. it's, it's faith. Um, I, I really, for me, the, the podcasts that, that get me are the ones that are going to make me think or the storytelling. Mm. And I'm just fascinated by just some of the, the stories that are being told or, um, kind of the, the faith ones. There's one that I just started listening to. Um, I think it's, is it Bible recap? Um, but it's all the, it's like, it's like number two, I think in the world right now, which I was like, yeah, uh, but it's by D group. And it's, I think it's like, they do all these different Bible stories. Yeah, so I was just listening to the storytelling of it, which I think is really fascinating. So, okay. So I got to wrap up then by asking you, okay, Steve, do you think that that Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are coming back for the Clippers this year? And if so, how does that help our <laughs> playoff chances? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring them back. Um, oh, oh, you'd hold them out and get them healthy and stuff for next year. Yeah. I, I just, okay. I, I think, I think the clay, especially for Kawhi with clay coming back yep. and then quickly busting the other one. Yeah. There's just so much money invested in those two and, and chemistry. And this is really either, you know, there's four teams right now that are significantly <laughs> better than everybody else. Yeah. And I just think the Clippers know without those two at like top shape, yeah, th- there's no point to risk it in my opinion. So I, I told them. I agree, but it's been fun to see, um, Reggie Jackson just just go off yeah. lately. So shout out yeah. to Reggie. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you listen, Reggie. Probably not, but if you do, man, shout outs to you. <laughs> 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 well, we really appreciate it that mm. this time, Steve. Again, uh, please go on the show notes to look out for Steve's book along with the other books that he recommended. We really appreciate you having you on here, Steve, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk with you again. We'd love that. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, Jason. Thanks so much, Linda. And love what you guys are about and love the heartbeat of Saddleback and just the good that you all just continue to put out and embody in the world for Christ's name. And um, love you guys. Grace and peace. Oh, perfect. So, uh, friends, we will be back uh, with you next week. We, I think we're going to be starting our Easter specials next week. So make sure to come back for that. We'll have three weeks That is going to be an audio experience going through the Easter story. So make sure to come back for that. Friends, we love you. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Mm-hmm.